Well, welcome everybody. I'm going to turf it over to Patsy McCook, who will um, introduce Alicia, our special guest for today. So great to be with all of you. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. I don't think I'm visible, but that's all right. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I want to introduce Alicia Malardo, director of the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center. Alicia's entire professional life has focused on environmental education. Before coming to the center, she spent 20 years. Is that right, Alicia? Yeah, it was, feels like yesterday, but it's been a long couple decades. Yeah. <laughs> 20 years with the Stanford, Connecticut based Sound Waters Inc. And this is a group that features science education, youth development, and the conservation of Long Island Sound. And its teaching extends far beyond the classroom to field work, labs, a schooner, and an aquarium. Alicia received her undergraduate degree from Hawaii Pacific University with a major in marine biology. Yay! Alicia joined the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center in early 2019. So she had barely a year with us before COVID arrived. But thanks to Alicia, the RGPEC was able to shift nimbly from in-person classes, field work and lectures to virtual programming and more. So Alicia will tell us all about this. Welcome, Alicia. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Patsy. Thanks, Laura. Thank you all for letting me be here this evening. I'm thrilled. I always enjoy talking with people and meeting new people. So this is wonderful. I am going to talk a little bit tonight briefly about me, a lot about Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center, and then where we're going with the center and the big news that just broke in the past week or two. So um, I'm also, as I'm host, I'm still seeing people come in. So if you hear me pause, don't worry. I'm just admitting other folks to make sure that everybody can get in. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody still see that? Yes. And hear me. Okay, excellent, excellent. Well, as you know, I am Alicia Malardo. I'm the director at the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center. And I'm thrilled to be here this evening. Here comes APH33. I'm not sure who that is, but again, I'm just gonna let them all in. Okay, let them all Let them in. All right. So here we go. Can you see, let me see if I move that. Can you see it without the stop share in the middle of the title? Is that okay? Yes, that's great. Excellent. All right, so a little bit about me. Where, why am I here? Where did I come from? And, and why am I talking with you? Well, if you take a look at that picture on the left, that is me when I was two, loving the lobsters from Long Island Sound. Uh, I was really fortunate to grow up in Guilford right here on Long Island Sound. And both my parents instilled a love of the water, Donald, the water, Long Island Sound, and just being outdoors and appreciating the environment. Um, as I grew up, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure exactly what that meant, but I knew that the, the environment was close to me and it was, it was definitely part of my passion. As Patsy mentioned in the beginning, I spent a little about 20 years at one organization called Soundwaters. And that picture in the middle, you kind of go with my progression. When I was in college, I just finished college and I was at Soundwaters and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife called up and said, would you be willing and able to rescue 22 hatchling diamondback terrapins that were being that were just confiscated in Alaska and they were on their way to China for inappropriate use. Wow. I said absolutely and there if you take a look that is a diamondback terrapin that went from Alaska overnighted in a styrofoam cooler to me holding this um, in seven and a half hours. So you know, again, the love of the environment has been with me. And then where am I today? There I am holding our barred owl cookie in the Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center. So as you can see, it's been a lifelong love. I took my, oh, here comes. John. Hi. Hi, welcome everyone. 
So if you take a look at the RV, the research vessel on the left, that's RV Koholo, and that is in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii. I spent many a day on that, and the water looks very calm and flat. However, that was just a teaser of a picture because there were many days where we were in four, six foot swells and doing a lot of research. I sent a lot of Niskin bottles over the, over the edge there, over the stern to kind of- You've been there? Them. What's that? He's got the volume on. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Alan, you have to mute yourself. So then if you take a so look over on the right, that is one of the most photographed set of islands. Those, those are the Moloch, the Moks in Lanikai. And that is where I actually, I was living for the time I was in Hawaii doing my work. So again, I just, go here comes Emily again. Um, yeah. I just, that. you know, went from Long Island, Connecticut to Long Island, Town, Connecticut to Hawaii. Listen. And part of life is inspiring the next generation, right? So the top picture is me, my husband, and my two children up at Echo Lake in New Hampshire. And then the bottom picture is our immediate family, believe it or not. That's me, my siblings, my husband, his siblings, and my father, all right there on the Connecticut River, enjoying a beautiful day out there. So just a little bit of background about me and kind of how I came to be and when I got to RTP. So now I will kind of give you the goods of what you probably really want to hear about, which is not me, but it's RTPUC. So the Connecticut Audubon Society is not, is not the National Audubon Society. We are an independent organization and we are focused solely on Connecticut. We were founded, as you can see, in 1898. There's five centers, 19 sanctuaries, soon to be 20, because we will consider the Bee and Thistle a sanctuary. And then there's our headquarters at Birdcraft Museum in Fairfield, Connecticut. Mm. Feel free, by the way, to stop me and ask any questions. The mission of the Audubon Society is to protect the environment and all of the environment. We do focus on the birds, but a lot of what we do is the science education, conservation, and advocacy, all for Connecticut. And if you happen to know Frank Denardi, that photo is courtesy of him. That is an osprey taken past spring. Wow. I know, isn't that gorgeous? Yes. Mm. I'll go back if everybody wants to see it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's probably one of the most beautiful, just, just going in the water. Roger Tory Peterson is a regional center of the Connecticut Audubon Society. So we are the southeastern region for Connecticut Audubon. And as you know, our mission here is to focus on the estuary and promote scientific research of it. It's such a rich area. If you've been paying attention in the news at all, you've noticed probably that there's been some sightings of a humpback whale. Now that is tremendous and that's amazing, mm -hmm. but it's happened before. And now it's time, I think, for everybody to kind of pat themselves on the back and say, we must be doing something right and celebrate a little of that positive work. Every little bit we do is making a big difference and that, you know, the fish are coming back and who knows, we could keep seeing more humpback whales in there. All right, pop quiz. So if anybody is, oh, Nancy. Nancy, raise your hand. What is the name of this okay. fish? I was just going to ask you about, no, be, no, before the screen, about oh. the whales. Could it be oh, yeah. because of the uh, global warming? It, I mean, I guess it could be, but the fact is they were really coming here after the Menhaden, after the fish. And since those populations are coming back stronger. Okay. Um, okay. You could look at it. You, I don't know if there's definitely an answer to it, but they've been around before, but now that they're... Um, now that they're here, I think it's it's interesting. I'm going to say it's probably a combo. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So pop quiz, anybody know the name of this fish? If you do, go ahead and shout it out. It's found, I'll give you a clue. It's found right here in the Connecticut River. Is it a sturgeon? sturgeon. It is, it's the Atlantic sturgeon. Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about this is, again, it is on the comeback. They were not found for a long time and they were threatened and endangered and now they're on the on the way back nice job well, alicia i could tell you bob i could send you a photo of one in the connecticut river 
I would love that. Uh, that my grandchildren found is about five feet long. I wow, have I'd love to see that. I, I have photos, maybe I can get them to you at some point. That would wow. be great. When was that? Uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is obviously a juvenile and a very young one. So we know there have to be adult ones there. And the hard part about the sturgeon is that they do get caught up in some of the nets. And um, but again, the waters are, are getting a little cleaner. So, wow. Oh, yeah, Donald, if you could share that, I'd love to see that. Okay, we'll, we'll have to get share contact information when we're done. Absolutely. When people think about the Connecticut Audubon Society, they clearly think about birds and we love the birds, but we're not only about the birds. There's such an amazing world right here in Southeastern Connecticut that we focus on all of it, whether it's the habitats, the aquatic vegetation, the soil, the uh, vernal pools. It's all there in our, in our world that we are educating the students on and the adults about. Um, and this wasn't part of my quiz, but it does anybody, can anybody identify that aquatic plant? I'll give you a hint. It is very invasive. And if you are ever in Hamburg Cove or yes. Wellbone Cove, it is there and it is in force. That is hydrilla. 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 Okay. Invasive species and it's very aggressive. So it will, um, it can easily clog your, your prop. All right. So how do we implement that mission? Because it's a big mission and it's a wonderful mission. But how do we implement it? Easily, it's through education for youth and adults all over. And I'll talk a little bit later about our educational reach. Our outreach programs, stop it, stop which it, stop it. many of them have become virtual now to be safe and make sure that we help to stop the spread of COVID-19. Community engagement and advocacy. If you have participated in our lectures, uh, thank you. But also, I, if you haven't, I hope you do because they are amazing. We have a board of directors team that works very hard to bring um, some truly wonderful speakers. And then our scientific research, you heard me talk very briefly about hydrilla. We focus a lot of what we do on the research. So research, advocacy, education, conservation, it all really weaves very nicely together. And, uh, and that's really how we execute and implement our mission. <clears throat> that for the people who are wondering, gosh, I think I've seen that before. That is the boardwalk right there in Old yes. Lime of the Roger Tory Peterson. Great. Okay, our education. So I am thrilled to announce that in the past year, we reached over 5,000 youth and adults. And why is that so significant? Because you'll hear many organizations talk many, much bigger numbers. We're only five years old. So we started our first class was 35 students. And I know we have some chats coming in. Oh. Uh, we started with one class and 35 students. And just this year, we reached over 3,500 students in our schools and over 1,500 um, community members in our other programs. Wow. Since, yeah, since COVID hit and kind of everybody was in lockdown, we locked down, I believe it was March 13th and the following Wednesday, we launched our first virtual program. And since then we have conducted 85 of them. It's an amazing team led by Heather Cordula. If you see her around town, she is the best education manager. And uh, between her and the educators we have on team, they, they've really done everything in our webinars from how to put a bird feeder together which is very interesting, how to create a toad abode or a fairy garden. Also to all about warblers, what about the finches, all the birds that are migrating. So the webinars are for a range of people, they're broad topics, but they're very, they're fun and they're educational. Our lecture series that I spoke about earlier, we have people from Connecticut to Hawaii, from Delaware, somebody uh, from Costa Rica, and they're really, they're amazing. To date, we have reached 22 towns in the city of New London, and we have many partners. Collaborating is part of our DNA. 
and you know everybody does something really well and working together we can really lift and raise each other up like i said education is a little different today than it was a year ago if you look at that top picture that is our virtual class which is they're phenomenal they're um interactive and weekly and they're just they're wonderful they're private for about 15 to 20 participants and then on the bottom right that was our virtual summer camp class um, because we couldn't do an in-person one. Mm. So education's a little different, but what I will say is that it's still hands-on and interactive, even virtually. We have, um, we received funding to bring pack, packets to the schools this fall that include some scientific equipment. So when they, the students are at their school and we're giving the lesson over Zoom or over Google Classrooms, the students all have the same pieces of equipment. They don't have to share them. So we're following all the safety guidelines and it's been a real great success for us and for the students, of course. So as I said, if you take a look, I promise not a lot of graphs, just two real quick, quick, just to brag and shout out to RTPC and the team that had come before me and where we're going. So if you take a look, when we started, we had 35, this year we reached over 5,000 and in a couple of years we're looking to reach over 6,600. So big goals, big dreams and lots of good stuff happening. Again, we started with one class. We're reaching over 22 and we're just, we're looking to keep growing. Wow. Uh, one program that I'm really proud about that we actually are still doing even virtually is Meet the Scientist. We, we believe that it's really important for students to understand that scientists um, do all sorts of different tasks, whether it's in a lab, in the research field, at a university, we really wanna share that with them. So this was uh, taken last year and this was Dr. Thyler and he came in from Woods Hole and he spoke with the students about what he does and how all of the subjects that they study in school are so important to science. And they just thought it was the coolest to really meet the scientist. Um, so again, different ways, reaching out to students to make sure that all the learners can hear and, and enjoy what we do and what they can do. So if you take a look, this was the last, currently the last in-person lecture series that we had planned to run. But if you take a look at the date, April 30th, 2020, you can imagine that it did not happen in person, but we did do it virtually. Um, we have two major components of our outreach for adults, and that's the River, River Lecture Series. And then the other part is our citizen science. And I would encourage everybody to start looking into that in the spring when uh, we're ready to do it. Some of these can be done independently. So you're not with other people and everybody can stay safe, but yet you're still contributing to scientific data. So one of those is our Osprey Nation. There are over 400 platforms in the state of Connecticut that the Connecticut Audubon Society is in charge of. And having volunteers monitor it is very, very helpful as you can imagine. And there are a few in the southeastern Connecticut region. So when did the osprey come back? What are the hatchlings doing? When did, the, when did they fledge? Um, another component to look at is bird count. During migration season, it's really important for us to get a sense of what type and how many birds are coming through. So we set that up. Uh, there is also one happening in December. It's called the Christmas count. So if you're interested in that, feel free, shoot us an email and we can connect you with some people that are doing it. Again, we are restricting some of them to make sure that people are safe. And then creek critters, <laughs> it's a lot of fun and exactly what it sounds like. Go out into the creek and take your sample and tell me what you know invertebrates and macro and micro invertebrates you find. Um, again, really fun stuff happening. All right, last pop quiz, I promise, but I always like to ask people before, you know, you're getting too excited about the Osprey monitoring. Who knows how long is the Connecticut River and how many states does it run through? 410 miles. Ooh, Amy, for the win. <laughs> ding, ding, right on track. Absolutely. And how many states? 
Uh, plus Canada. How many, Donald? Four plus Canada. You are correct. Whoo! This is a sharp group. Oh boy. <laughs> yes. All right. That was amazing. Good job. Yeah. And obviously this is a beautiful picture right there of the mouth of the Connecticut River. One early summer day. There you go. Mm -hmm. And you are right. A tiny little bit in Canada. But since we're just talking about the states, you are correct for states and empties. All right. Our last, the last component of our mission is science and research. And this is a picture from a two years ago, one of our college interns, remember I talked about we love to collaborate, one of our college interns from Mount Holyoke University is doing what we call SAV, Submerged Aquatic Vegetation Research. So they are monitoring and they're identifying and counting certain points all over the lower Connecticut River and especially in certain coves to see what plants are there today versus a study that was done 20 years ago by uh, Juliana Barrett. So it's really neat. She had a baseline that we are able to work off of. And what I can tell you so far today is that the native plants have been very much taken over by some of those invasive species. So we have another this year and next year, like 2021 and 2022 to complete the original study but I don't think we can wait that long to take some action with the invasive. So we're working with Gateway Commission, Connecticut Ag Station, Connecticut River Conservancy to make sure that when we do try and pull them and make a dent in removing the invasives that we do it properly because there are ways that you can actually increase it if you pull it at the wrong time and let the seeds come out. So it's a really neat, um, component of what we do and we are looking to figure out how to increase it so it can be for citizens to citizen science study for community members to help us pull because there is so much of it. At RTPC we're a little unique that we have this amazing science advisory board from staff and professors and scientists from all over New England from Woods Hole to Wesleyan and NOAA we work very closely with them and of course, Yukon right here and Yale. So we're really thrilled. They help us make some tough decisions when we need to. Here comes George. George, you're late. <laughs> and <laughs> so we're really thrilled. It is chaired by Dr. Wayne Geyer, Rocky, if you know him, and advocacy. If you were here in Old Lyme when they were trying to put the high speed train through RTPC stepped in and helped with the environmental um, component of that. And we also just wanna make sure that we are looking at all the environmental issues that are happening uh, with ourselves at the board level. And of course, in the community to see what is going on. Currently, if you've heard about it, we are participating in the, oops, sorry, the Connecticut NER, the National Estuarian Research Reserve. We're partnering with the Pew Charitable Trusts Foundation and if you're not familiar with what a NER is, it is an area that will be designated, hopefully, in Connecticut for research and education, and it will be for everybody. So it's a, it's a great location. It's a great project, and I'll show you a little bit more about where that will be in a couple slides. So today's impact, I talked about the high-speed train and then the NER, and of course, I had to throw in one of the one of the studies that we're still working on, which is the swallows murmuration. And that's a great shot from last summer, mm -hmm. all the swallows. Currently, this is what we're working on and this is the proposed nurse site. So if you see the smaller picture on the bottom right, that's really where it runs. It runs about 50 miles from Barn Island all the way over and up partway of the Connecticut River. And there, we did a public meeting in August, I believe it was. And some of the concern was that maybe we should scooch it a little further up the river. So we're looking at that um, with DEP. This is a very, this project is, it's a long project. It will take a long time, but we have two terrific board members who are working on it. And again, it's gonna help us conserve and research and learn more about the, the habitats right here in Long Island Sound. 
going forward, what else do we want to do for mm-hmm. research in general? Well, you know, we're fortunate that we, that's not our only mission. So we can kind of, if you will, pick and choose and we will, but really it's, it's to make sure that everybody's informed about what's going on and to make sure that we're keeping the best for the environment in mind and, and working on sustainable solutions and, and policies. You know, we all have to work together on it and, uh, and, and we will. As important community issues come up and regional ones, we, we will be there. So the exciting news broke, gosh, I think it was two weeks ago, correct? That um, we've got a new home. And if you've followed RTPC at all, we started in the back of our founder's trunk of her car, uh, Eleanor Robinson, who's amazing and still on our board. And um, so when this came up for sale, we thought, wow, that would be amazing. It's on the Lieutenant River this could be perfect. And so we, as you can see, we're, we're working on hopefully closing in December. Why did we want a new home? I, I, you know, if you don't know, right now we're in the storefront right next to Best Cleaners and Walgreens. We're right in the middle of those two. And I'm probably one of the only ones who thinks it's very cool that we're there because everybody pops in and stops by and says hello, whether they're going to the market or the pharmacy but it doesn't really give you that nature center feeling. So, um, and we can't have students in it. And that's really, remember, that's our mission, that's our core. So this will allow us to reach more students and, um, and, and do more research right there and also preserve a community landmark, which we're really excited to do. Alicia, as you move toward the Vian Thistle, will you retain the name? Oh, that's a good, I, you know, that question has not come up. Will we re- retain the name of RTPC or the Bee and Thistle? Um, the, the uh, well, and they might be combined in one way or another, but certainly Bee and Thistle is a landmark that's remarkable. And in mm. the 60 years or so I've lived in Old Lyme, I've always known where that was. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's a good point. I, I don't, there's been no talk of getting rid of it. But how we incorporate it, I'm not sure. So, you know, I, I think that's a good point. You're the first person I can tell you. You are the first person to ever bring that up. Well, I, I, I'm glad I could be a little bit helpful, but Very. certainly name recognition re- recognition for a location is always helpful. It's very helpful. You're right, and it's. I mean, like I've. It's a love area. I beloved. It's a beloved location, and. Uh, we want to make sure we keep it that way and open it to the community more. So if you've enjoyed it for the past 60 years, I hope you continue to enjoy it with us. And, uh, and we promise we'll do our best to make it fun for everybody. The neat thing about the Bean Thistle is its location for us. There's grounds where we can have a summer camp. If you want to have a private event, we will still be offering that ability. We're right there on the Lieutenant River. There is a little bit of... Um, a beach at the right water tide. I don't know if it's really considered a beach. It's more of like a sand drop in my mind. (laughs) Um, And a little landing dock that we could hopefully launch some kayaks or I've been looking into water bikes. How fun would that be to bike around on the water out there? Just let people get outdoors, enjoy it, experience it, a little bit of exploration and really connect if, you know, during this pandemic I think people have all come together and found solace in the environment and uh, and we hope to be able to offer that more the other great part about moving to the bee and thistle is that it will allow us to really dive deeper into some of our research whether it's you know coastal erosion or uh, flow rate sediment um, sampling, soil porosity, all of that for everyone. And our programs, our signature program, which is science and nature, that will continue to run the model it has where we go to the schools. What's been happening in the past five, 10 years in public education is the budgets keep decreasing for transportation and the transportation costs are so expensive. So 
the team at RTPAC in Connecticut Audubon created this wonderful program, Science and Nature, where we go to the school and it can be in any town or city and we find the natural environment near their school within walking distance or sometimes it's right on the school grounds um, and we'll conduct the program there. Obviously, I hope you've been looking through this, you know, we'll increase our science and residence program, citizen science, and then one area where we're ready to expand is our high school student uh, internship. I think it's so important for students to get a sense of what does it mean to do research? Because I can tell you that when I was in high school and college, I was, I'm going to do research, I'm going to do research. And then one of my professors let me do research. And I think I lasted two days when I realized I was going to be sitting outside by myself. Some people love that. And that's great. But I was not able to do that. I was bored. I was done. I was ready to go back into the lab and be able to be social and talk with people and talk about ideas. And um, I think it's important for high school students to get that opportunity to work with real scientists and, and learn what's research, what's field research, what's lab research, what do they all mean? So they have a better sense when they move on, whether they choose to go to college or not. And then of course, we are going to be in this big location with beautiful grounds and we really wanna increase our volunteer particip participation. We will have pollinator gardens and mm. organic gardens. We're hoping to have a, um, a greenhouse and we'll put up some bird houses and bat boxes and uh, purple martin. I call them the purple martin condos if you've ever seen those. Uh, so again, areas where we can increase community connection and education for all. As I've been saying, it's a beautiful picture right on the river. Um, we all have the environment in common and I want to make sure that we we remember that it's been a very tense few months for everything. You know, 2020 is like no other, but when we stop and we take a moment and we take a breath, we realize that we all have the environment in common. And I want everybody to know that you know, we're locally relevant and we're nationally significant. So um, that's it for me. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. If not, that's okay too. I have a question. This is Mike Gentry. Hi, Mike. At the beginning of the COVID crisis, there was a lot of talk about for the first two months, environments in big cities were healing very quickly. I, I haven't heard anything about that in six months. I, it, I, did it plateau out? Did it stop? I, I just, I was wondering if you knew. Yeah. So some of those reports were false. Like, um, I think if you remember, they were saying in Venice, there were dolphins jumping in the rivers and everything. Now mm -hmm. the water had been cleaned up for sure, but um, I heard, I've, I've read in one paper that the, there were not dolphins jumping in there. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking more of air pollution. Well, yeah, there, I mean, everything has cleaned up, but they have not yeah. reported on that. I think- Okay between, well, that I have read, how about that? I'm sure there's some, and I can look into that for you, but I know that the, um, that would be an interesting webinar for us to put on actually. So I'm originally I'm up. from a little town, a hundred miles or no, yeah, about 60 miles east of Pittsburgh. Okay. And so when I was a kid, we were told very specifically when we went to visit Pittsburgh, don't go in the river. It will rot your skin. <laughs> okay. Um, it will burn. I mean, there was just too much, but now it has clean Lake Erie. They've reintroduced fish. Um, so, you know, it, it, I don't know. And, and part of what I'm also going to ask about is that in some cases, invasive species, uh, taking them out have created problems also because things adapt. Mm -hmm. We actually have a, um, a young man from old Lyme who, before he went back to grad school to get his PhD, was working on a project in New York State, the, the new pipeline or new mm -hmm. water line from upstate mm -hmm. New York down into the city. And fixing that will cause the destruction of several wetlands that have been created by leaks in the pipe and the, the old pipe, and they're going to fix them. So, you know, some of that is you change things and it's, you know, what is good, what is not so good. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, right here in Connecticut, we have, there's been a lot of change, right? We used to have lobsters all the time and now they're gone. And what was that from? We don't know, but now we have Asian shore crabs. You know, you turn a rock over anywhere on the beach along the Connecticut coast and you'll find an Asian shore crab and that is an invasive species. And, you know, then it was said that it was pushing out the green and blue crabs. Well, then last year we had more green and blue crabs than we had in years past. And I, I agree with you. The one thing about the aquatic vegetation is it's, um, it's really removing some of the, uh, in the native species that are more nutrient for the waterfowl and some of the birds. So, uh, you know, not saying we can eradicate it because I'm not sure we can, excuse me, it's so aggressive and it has adapted so well, frighteningly well. Well, we have a house in New Hampshire, not far from Echo Lake. Oh, oh okay, uh, we, okay. we have a house in Wolfboro. Oh, okay. And uh, they're big on milfoil because they're having problems with that. So anytime you mm -hmm. take a boat in or out of the water, they have, during the summer, they have people there to help you inspect it and learn how to take care of it. Yeah, and we have that in Connecticut as well. You're not supposed to bring your boat from uh, fresh water to another fresh water or into obviously brackish water. You are supposed to, you know, clean it off appropriately, let it dry and, and make sure that you know, you, you're not transport, transporting any right. species from one area to the other. Does everybody follow that? I think we can uh, yeah. clearly say no because it's many ways how it's moving. Um, and one last question. Here, and I'll, well, I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say one last question, then I'll stop hogging the microphone. No problem. Go ahead. Did you eat that lobster in that first picture? Because it looked like you were in your kitchen. Oh, yeah, I surely did. Are you kidding? Yeah. We um, learned never let the kids play with the with their food because uh, <laughs> when it goes in the pot, they get all upset. Oh, no, we learned pretty quickly that it wasn't such a big deal and that if we wanted to enjoy it, that's how it had to get cooked. But no, okay. we were really fortunate. My dad, uh, he had a few pots when I, when we were little. So we definitely were fortunate to have all those lobsters. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, just a comment. Sure. Um, this is Nancy. I, I just want to commend Roger Torrey Peterson Estuary Center for all the virtu wonderful virtual programs. I have enjoyed so many of them. Oh, great. Well, thank they've, you. They've really helped me stay connected during this pandemic. I'm really glad to hear that. That's part of our goal for it. Obviously, it's educating, but it's really Zoom's unbelievably connecting, right? And just yes. you feel as if we may not be in the same room, but we're still, we're having this con conversation, we're interacting. Uh, I'm really glad you're appreciating appreciating. So thank that. you very much. Thank you. Nancy, do you have any suggestions for improvement or other topics? I thought this was wonderful tonight. <laughs> um, I'm involved with the Florence Griswold, which is right next door to the Bean Thistle. So I'm mm -hmm. anxious to know, um, to, uh, I'm, I'm anticipating the networking that will start growing. So when I first came here in February of 2019 to RTPC, I wanted to meet the, their new director at that point too. I think she'd only been around for not even a year yet. And right, so right. We met right away and then we've connected very well and we've, we've remained colleagues, but also friends. And I called her a couple weeks before the story was going to break and said, what do you think if this goes through? And she said, that would be awesome. Oh, I'm so, so happy. Yeah. So Becky and I are, are good colleagues, but also friends. And we have, we've joined on grant proposals before. Okay. And, uh, I can see this being a very good collaboration. Um, their artist trail, we help put yes. in the boxes and everything kind of just, you know, it's oh, the environment's wonderful. not necessarily there their expertise so they called us and we were happy to help on that and uh, I just I think it's going to be a great relationship that continues to thrive. wonderful wonderful anything else I'm happy to answer I'm happy to go back if anybody wants to see any of the other beautiful pictures again those are from Frank Denardi who's a local to Old Lyme and uh he, he's just he's got a great great view and uh he was... now that and that uh this is mike gentry again i'm mm -hmm. 
going back on what I said, one of my hobbies is nature photography and particularly bird photography. And I've gone to several programs at the Connecticut River Museum, but mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't know of any that you folks have held. Uh, any webinars in general or specifically on bird photography? On bird photography. No, but we'd love to have you do one. Well, I'm not sure I'm qualified to do one, but because um, <laughs> there are, like you say, they, I mean, the, the gentleman who took that osprey picture, mm. I've been trying for 20 years to get an osprey. I've got some good osprey pictures. Nothing like that. That is just amazing. The symmetry about the wings and just the straight on the fish, um, you know, because osprey are that when they grab a fish, they have it pointed into the wind instead of cross like an eagle does. An eagle does so it crosswise. And Osprey does it uh, straight on to minimize the drag because it's a smaller uh, bird than the uh, um, eagle. Let me go back. That was further back than I remembered, I guess. So if you take a very, very, very close look, you can tell there are three more um, images that he sent me and he actually has a fish in his talons. So yeah. exactly what you were saying, um, you'll see, we don't usually use those pictures and um, public presentations because some people don't like them, which I totally understand. But uh, yeah, no, this this is a phenomenal image. Um, we are hoping that he will do a webinar, but we'd love for you too to do one. Mm. Don't know if I have enough good pictures. Well, at least that I think are good. So that's <laughs> <laughs> well, I will consider it. So Alicia, I'm wondering if like that beautiful nature picture of the Connecticut River and the dock at Ely's Ferry, if, if maybe you would allow us to use one in a church newsletter and give the credit to the Roger Tory Peterson Center. Absolutely. It would, the photo credit would go to Frank Denardi. Um, I can send you the proper crediting, but yes, you are, you are welcome to use it. That would be great. So Alicia, I have a question. This is Laura. Um, oh. Your neighbors are the Florence Griswold Museum. I just wondered what collaborations might be in store mm -hmm. in the future. So um, some I can talk about, some I can't because we haven't received the funding yet. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, obviously they have their artist trail and we would love to expand that trail to go further onto the Bee and Thistle property um, because it's been such a hit and it's a great way for people even during a pandemic outside of a pandemic to really enjoy and we could bring people right up to the river have different bird houses bird boxes pollinator gardens for people to learn about and enjoy on the walk uh, we also we've done some programming for them before uh, outdoor education we had planned to do a lot in the past eight months mm -hmm. um for their constituents. However, of course, those plans got squashed. So mm -hmm. we will we will collaborate on education programs uh, mm -hmm. with them on their property, on our property. And obviously we're open to all sorts of ideas. Now that this we hope is coming to fruition, uh, we close in December that um, we, we can really start getting creative and thinking long and hard about other ways that we can collaborate. So we're open to mm -hmm. ideas if you have any that you've thought of. But, um, but we're, we're really ready to get those wheels turning. I wonder, I wonder if their artist, Julie Riggs, could somehow collaborate bringing art mm -hmm. to the science. Yeah, to educational our programs. Mm -hmm. That would be wonderful. I think there's a lot of potential there. I mean, even just besides photography, but what else can we do? Um, mm -hmm. for Painting. All ages? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. sketching. Bring it back to the roots, yep. Yeah, no, I, I think we've got a lot of a lot of opportunities. Sure. Yeah. Your plain air. <laughs> Any other questions? Comments, thoughts? No. Well, thank you again. This is it's wonderful to chat with you all and 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 hear your ideas and and I appreciate you letting me take the time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alicia. Alicia. Yeah, thank you to uh, you for this wonderful presentation, the, the visuals and the uh, extensive um, PowerPoint sharing all that you've 
that you're doing and, and will be doing. It's, it's very exciting. So we certainly appreciate um, your expertise and, and your time sharing with us this, this evening. Well, you are welcome. I will stop share. So everybody, here we go. And I will give hosting back. There you go. Well, thank you for hosting. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to everyone who has been on the call tonight. Wonderful turnout. And this will be available on our website too. So Wonderful. Very good. Patsy, is there anything else you would like to say? No, I'm just delighted at how many people uh, joined the Zoom tonight. And I think it's, uh, it's wow. a testament to yes. Alicia and um, the organization, how, how much we have to offer and how exciting and interesting it is and can be to so many people. So I want to thank Laura for getting us going and Alicia for your presentation. Wonderful, yes. both. Yes, very good. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you all.